Friends online, thank you for being so patient with us and this journey we make together by the power of the Holy Spirit, God is with us. I welcome us in the name of our shepherding God. I'm Pastor Wan Ji, serving here at Eldersgate United Methodist Church. Welcome to our hybrid worship, both online and in person. All are welcome here, and all always means all. Come, let us celebrate God, whose kindness and mercy follows us all the days of our lives, and in whom we dwell, move, and have our being. Let us begin to come into the presence of God. Please join me in the call to worship, responding as all. Come, let us worship God, who is deserving of praise, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and strength. Come, let us worship God. Let us pray. O oh God, shepherd of us all, we thank you for protecting us, guiding us, feeding us, loving us. Be with us even now. Receive our worship, our praise, and our concerns in this time of worship. May we rest our hopes in you that we may be led to open our hearts to the blessings of the word, song, and sacrament. Amen.
mission this morning, which is first a shout out to Jen, who may be watching online now or later on YouTube, um, for all the ways that she has been shepherd, shepherding and mothering our children and youth through the years. And as we transition to children's time, uh, with myself and uh, Vince once a month until I ask us to pray for our new children and youth families minister. So I'm not sure how we used to do it in the past, but if Simon and Leanna is comfortable coming and sitting next to me, you're welcome to. If you're more comfortable sitting there, you're welcome to do that. So come and sit. And I wanted to thank you, Simon, for the, uh, whenever you light the candle, you know, that takes a, it's a service, it's love. The first time I did it as an adult, I was like, it wouldn't light because someone didn't make the wick a little bit taller. And I was so nervous and I thought to myself, oh God, help me. And it, made, it humbled me because I said, even to light a candle, you need to pray and you need to know that God is present. But the important act of you lighting the candle is a symbol for the Holy Spirit. And Simon, I want you to know that same light, that Holy Spirit, is within your heart. Okay, the love of God is within you. So practicing lighting the candle in community is a reminder for you to know that you love and you do these services in this community of the Holy Spirit. That's what the church is. And the story we have in the book of Acts, which actually means acts of the Holy Spirit, so the actions of the Holy Spirit, and often in community like this, um, tells us today a story about a woman named Tabitha. And the writer also tells us her name was Dorcas, Dorca. And the importance of having woman's name in the Bible is really critical because often we don't have names of the woman in the Bible. So this is something to pay attention to when they say Tabitha and Dorca. And the author tells us that uh, the readers must have been a diverse community, people who spoke different languages, uh, people who shared in different cultures, because Tabitha is an Aramaic name, but the author tells us her Greek name was Dorca. So we're talking to an audience that is expanding, becoming more multicultural, becoming more diverse. And um, Dorca becomes ill and she dies, and we have this story today in which all the women, the community around her, comes and stands and pleads with Peter to offer healing for Dorca. And Dorca was a woman who uh, made clothes for other women, and not just any other woman, but women who were widows and who were marginalized. That means that um, Probably they were poorer because in those days only men and their male children can inherit wealth. And so if you were a woman who didn't have a son um, and who was a widow, you were probably very poor. And there was no way for the woman to acquire wealth. So they had to depend on others' compassion. So Dorka was a woman who had a lot of compassion and she would make clothes um, for the other woman. So um, I th her being a maker of clothes reminded me of the importance of loving one another in community, that we need each other and we need to love each other. And not just in the community of this church, but the story today tells us about an expanding community. So outside of her, her people, if you want to say, she kept drawing the circle wider and wider. So I thought I'd share with you, this is a, a clothing, if you want to say, a yoke that was made for me by a woman. And if you, on my ordination, a uh, woman became able to be ordained in 1956, and I was ordained in 2009, not 2014, I'm sorry, 2000 is not when I graduated. And it's in the shape of a fish, I don't know if you can kind of see it, a rainbow fish, and that meant uh, a symbol for Christ. I'm yoked with Christ, and it had rainbow colors because our community continues to expand, and it had the Methodist cross because that was the uh, community that I was being called into. So I wanted to share that um, it takes being yoked with other people. So I always remember this woman, her name was Rini, who made this for me, and the community of uh, the church we belong to serve together in, but also the community of her family and the ministries that she did outside of our church, in the community, 
Um, she often served with people who were poor and had uh, needs for food or clothing. And I want to share with you, and here's another example. This was from my ordination that another woman who was ordained way before me but had to go through a lot of barriers uh, made this for me. And the red color, which is traditional for a woman's ordination, means the community of the Holy Spirit, that we are yoked together in this community. And the Holy Spirit, like that candlelight and the light in you, Simon, will help you to love, will teach you to love. And when I came to Aldersgate, um, we had confirmations, Liana, and uh, Ruth made all these for all the confirmands. It was a little prayer quilt, and uh, she also made one for me. It says, Trust in the Lord, Aldersgate United Methodist Church. And it's a reminder. I, I, I love that it was in the color red. Again, the reminder that in the Holy Spirit, we pray together for one another, kind of like all these little pieces represents. Uh, the diversity and the, that we're knit together. So Ruth did that for me. I also want to share with you, we have a people who knit uh, prayer shawls, and this is by Renee, and these are prayer shawls, kind of like what we gave to the confirmands, but we also make this piece of clothing, if you say, and we send this out to people who uh, need to be covered with prayers and love, okay? And we trust that the Holy Spirit uh, can heal people in ways that we may not all know how when we pray. And Simon, here's a picture of a woman. Her name is Susan. And she uh, was part of, she is part of the Communities of Belonging, which is a community outside of Eldersgate. And she had a surgery, and we had somebody inspired to make these prayer shawls, okay? And then we had somebody inspired by love and the Holy Spirit to post this in this little package to Susan, and then Susan opened it, and that love kept expanding out, and Susan wrote, would you like to read this for me, Simon, right there, what does she say right there? I just got your package, thank you so much, you, you make me feel so loved, may God bless you. Yeah, so she bears witness to the love of God. So you see how that circle keeps growing out? And then I shared it with you folks today. So the message continues to go out to our online communities. And I want to thank you both. I know you both participated in these Encore kits. Again, something we are making together as a community. And our church, I think there was like 20 boxes of these out in the hallway that you all packaged and people contributed to. So it's just one piece given by members of our church. This will be sent out by the power of the Holy Spirit and our prayers, and it's going to go to communities all over the world, not just in the United States, but in, in the global world for people in need. So that is the power of the Holy Spirit. It can burn like a fire in a positive way, a love that moves and uh, crosses boundaries. So what I have uh, given to us here today, because we are in need of a volunteers to work with our Sunday school students uh, in the coming month, I will give the children's message, but I'm going to invite you today on Mother's Day to go back to uh, be in worship with us in this holy community. And I have put in here in these packages uh, a heart box, some crayons. There is, I want you to read the story of Tabitha in more detail. There's another craft in here that you can do at home and if you want to give it to someone who you see as loving. And, and it's because it's a Mother's Day, I've also included a piece of paper there. If you want to write down all the ways uh, you see love in action um, in and through people who are mothering, and I use the word ing verb, it doesn't just have to be our biological mom. Uh, uh, you are blessed with beautiful mom Melissa. And so if you want to write some of the ways that she works uh, to love and community, you're welcome to do that too. So I'm going to give you both one each to take that with you and be in community with us as we worship today. Let me pray with us. And I'm going to pause. And Liana and Simon, if you want to say anything in the prayer, you're welcome to do that too. Okay, I'll pause for just a second. And if you want to add anything, um, let the Holy Spirit speak in and through you. Okay, let us pray. Loving and gracious God, this community is so blessed by the presence of the light 
of the Holy Spirit and Simon and Leanna, and we give you thanks that in and through them, you will bless our world with compassion, with service that clothe the hungry, the naked, the imprisoned, those who may be less visible to us. We pause now, O oh God, to name anyone that Simon or Liana would like to make more visible. Call us into action to love together as the church because we need each other to, the, to make our circles wider. Um, we, we give prayers to our mom and that, she's, um, that she continues to do her thing best. Praise be to God for all the ways Melissa mothers to her own children as well as to this church community and beyond our gates, beyond these doors. We give you all praise and thanksgiving and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. If you are able in body and or spirit, let us arise. This morning singing. <laughs>
gift and talent of your music and sharing it with us this morning. And Cindy, Cindy, yes. (laughs) I'm a little bit more tired than usual because this is our second service this weekend. So thank you, Cindy. Um, The prayers... The flowers this morning, I want to acknowledge that uh, we continue to pray with the families of Polly Williams and that uh, Polly uh, gives us these flowers. Uh, Yellow was the favorite color for Polly, uh, the yellow rose, in memory of her mom, Polly. Um, And the flowers this morning is in honor and celebrations of all persons mothering um, with the love of God for all people. Please join me in the prayers of the people, and I ask you to, when I pause, respond with thank God for all our mothers. And there's one way at the end after I say amen, so uh, let us pray together. Mothers come in many different forms, and today we remember them all. For those women who have left earth too soon and in whom we miss dearly. For For every woman who is raising children now, making sacrifices for her children's becoming. For For those women who have taken in others' children through adoption and foster care, showing us that the love of God far extends beyond biological ties. For those women with grieving hearts for children that could have been with futures so different from they planned. For For the special neighbors, teachers, and friends who have nurtured us, supported us, and helped us to become the people we are today. For For mothers in which our relationships are complicated, difficult, or strained, but who have forced us to choose healthier paths for our lives. And now with a mothering heart for your children, we lift up our prayers this week with and for Bob Olson, who has been hospitalized. Um, God, provide, provide him with mothering hands through the health care givers and providers, and through our prayers, our hands. We pray for um, his daughter, Troy, as she continues to journey with her dad as he goes through health care needs. We pray with them for Isba DeLongre's cousin, William, who is now recovering back at home with a stent that his heart will be made full with the joys of an abundant life. We pray with and for communities of belonging for their safety and sustainability. We pray with and for families with generational trauma and experiencing brokenness that you would continue to shepherd them with kindness and mercy. We also, God, celebrate in this month the lives and joys of Asian American Pacific Islanders. We celebrate this month, oh God, teachers. We celebrate Polly's new day, her resurrection life, and the here and now as she lived and moved amongst us and in the promises of coming face to face with her creator. We give you thanks, O God, for 66 years of full clergy rights for women in the United Methodist Church. Both our joys and our concerns remind us, O God, of the hope you have for us as our mothering God. And you remember us into that someday, that someday of a new heaven and a new earth 
where love, justice, and peace will prevail. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. prayers that we shared prior to service um, that will be in our prayer list this coming week and hold what we have shared um, as we share in the prayers, the prayer that Jesus taught us himself. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. today is from Acts chapter 9 verses 36 through 43. I am reading from the inclusive Bible. Listen, now in Joppa there was a disciple, a woman named Tabitha, Dorcas in Greek, who never tired of doing kind things or giving to charity. About this time she grew ill and died. They washed her body and laid her out in an upstairs room since Lydda was near. The disciples sent two couriers to Peter and the urgent request, please come over to us without delay. Peter sat out with them as they asked upon his arrival. They took him upstairs to the room. All the town's women who had been widowed stood beside him weeping and showed him the various garments Dorcas had made when she was still with them. Peter first made everyone go outside, then he knelt down and prayed. Turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, stand up. She opened her eyes, then looked at Peter and sat up. She gave, him, gave her his hand and helped her to her feet. The next thing he did was to call in those who were believers, including the widows, to show them that she was alive. This became known all over Joppa, and because of it, many came to believe in Jesus Christ. Peter remained a while in Joppa, staying with Simon, a leather tanner. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'm going to take a moment here to spend quite the weekend, and um, I'm feeling a little bit like I need the prayers of the community. I call upon the Holy Spirit. The challenge to children as they are growing is that they not only grow physically, but growing to become more loving and more compassionate. It was the same challenge that the disciples faced. They were Jews like Jesus, their rabbi, who were breaking boundaries from adhering to laws that once were set in place as practices of loving one another in community to how changing communities to, needed to change how they loved as well. Love exists in relationships, 
relationship with God, ourselves, and one another, even our enemies, as love is not stagnant. Same is true for Christians today. We also are evolving, and what we believed in and practiced yesterday may not be true today. Christians do not exist as individuals, but we exist in community with one another. What makes one at dis-ease will make the other at dis-ease. In the story today, we are told that Peter stayed with a tanner, a leather tanner, ironically someone who shares his own former name when he was a fisherman, Simon. He stays at the home of Simon the tanner and eats with him. Simon the tanner is a person who touches dead animals, also considered an unclean person. Peter eats with this unclean person. The Jewish religion 2,000 years ago had many rules of do-nots, like do not worship or serve false gods. We do not sacrifice children or adults to those gods. We do not touch death or defile ourselves with unclean things. We do not even eat with people who do such things, which we see Peter doing. And his own conversion story following this story as he is staying with Simon the Tanner in the home of the unclean person. Simon the Tanner, so what is in contrast for disciples then and for us, is that Jesus gave a new commandment to love one another, including Simon the Tanner, to Simon the Fisherman, who later becomes Peter. How do we know we are disciples? By the positive and expanding commandment to love one another. A negative commandment you can stick with and check off. But this new commandment has no boundaries about who was deserving or not, who was in and who was out. In the end, they became so inclusive and redefining that they were not even able to stay as another sect in Judaism, but birthed a new church and Christianity. The book of Acts is about the birth of the church. These stories in the book of Acts shares that revolutionary way of loving one another. It's not about checking off, I was at church today, or checking off a bunch of do-nots, but about how lavishly, scandalously, generously, persistently, enduringly, riskingly, steadfastly, transgressingly did we embody loving one another and how it transformed us. Do we experience the joy of the gift of the Spirit active in our common shared life, our life in God? Do we glorify God by loving one another beyond borders? Maybe checking off those positive commands would mean we first turn towards God for God's mighty grace and love once again. We certainly can't do it alone, but only in community of the Holy Spirit together. We witness to another world possible by our words and our lives, that is, the practices of love. We carry gracious hints, little lights of this new vision, coming when we live in costly love for one another and when we practice disrupting welcome to those otherwise left outside. In the story of Peter's conversion while staying at the Tanners, the unclean person's home, which follows the story of Dorcas and her community in Joppa, what Peter understands is that when we practice loving one another, the boundaries of what we think is profane, which is not holy, is transformed to what is common, shared life together as the people of God. What is not holy through love is transformed as holy, Love has a way of breaking down boundaries. One of those boundaries in the times that Peter lived was these understandings of clean and unclean. In other words, what is sacred and what is profane, or in contemporary words, what is secular and what is church. Peter and the disciples' actions challenged the people of their day because their practice of loving as Jesus had lived, loved, and revealed to them broke down barriers. The Greek word used in Peter's vision staying at Simon the Tanner's home is that 
What is profane is what is holy, what is common, koinos, which translated means common. This same word is the root word for koinoia, and that is the word used in the book of Acts and the epistles as the synonym for a Christian community. We are the koinoia. We are the common life. This is shared by those who follow the ways of Jesus. Peter who had thought that the common was profane, was transformed by visions, and given the word koinos, meaning common. It is what we would later use as koinoia to name ourselves as the church. This common life koinoia is revealed more fully to us in the story of the common life shared by Dorca and her community. That was a koinoia, this community in Joppa. Dorcas is the only woman referred to as a disciple in the Bible. The word disciple is only used in reference to Dorca. A few notes about today's story in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the sequel written after the Gospel of Luke, and the author of Luke is the only Gentile to write a book in the Bible, and the writer is more inclusive of Gentiles. Some highlights we can notice that the author includes in their story is Luke's stories written in the book of Acts, that it begins in Jerusalem and ends in Rome. In other words, it begins in the hidden upper room with disciples huddled together and ends with Peter preaching boldly in Rome. In Acts, there's a progression, a progressive transition where the movement of the disciples by the actions of the Holy Spirit grew in holiness like wildfire. Along the way, Luke highlights two conversions. Last week's story about Paul on the road to Damascus and the story today, which leads to Peter's conversion in the house of the tanner, Simon. Our readings today about the raising of Tabitha in Aramaic, or as explained as Dorca in Greek, reveals that Luke is addressing an audience that includes Gentiles. Peter, we are told, travels to Joppa, which is modern-day Tel Aviv. Joppa is a seaport city, and it is the same city where Jonah was called to preach to the Nevenites 800 years before Peter. Maybe some of Eldersgate members who traveled to the Holy Land may have visited the home of Simon the Tanner. The people listening to today's story would clearly recognize what a social outcast and a person on the margins that both Dorcas and Simon the Tanner represented. Dorcas was a Gentile who clothed marginalized widows. Simon the Tanner worked with dead animals, and that meant exclusion and non-acceptance in social company. Being a Tanner meant you were a religious outcast. He would find acceptance in this movement that Paul and Peter and Dorcas practiced. The status quo religious practices was being challenged by the positive practice of love that was boundary crossing not only in Jesus' way while he was living, but now by the disciples, including Dorcas, a Gentile woman. She was a disciple of Jesus who healed a woman, dirty, with bodily discharge. Jesus ate with Gentiles. Jesus handled the dead and pretty much commingled with the dirty, the other, not like us class of people, including the financially poor and vulnerable Gentile women of Jesus' day. In our modern world, we still create the same types of exclusion both institutionally and individually. Instead of focusing on the holiness of God, the loving ways of God, we can be prone to often justifying ourselves as holy and others as less than holy and scapegoating others. We are the Gentiles that we have trouble extending both compassion through our personal practices as well as through our politics of do-nots. 
we practice more do nots than the practices of love, including ones today that are more liberating for women's choices and bodies. What practices of love, which is never separate from justice, liberty, and equity, would incarnate Jesus' way of compassion when it comes to discerning politically divided concerns of our modern day? In today's story, it is also no coincidence that we might also remember Jesus and Lazarus and the household in Bethany. The community in Joppa also is weeping like the sisters of Lazarus had. And unlike Lazarus, who we are told nothing about, here we are told how much good work Storcas has done and the widows of the community who stand to share the proof of her charity by showing the clothes that Dorcas has compassionately made for them. It is likely that her good works reached wider circles outside Joppa, as her name mentioned both as Tabitha in Aramaic and as Dorcas in Greek would indicate. These same widening circles is part of today's compassionate community in which Dorcas is raised to new life. The story of Dorcas reveals to us the growing community of discipleship when disciples like Dorcas did good works and the community around her would yearn for new life and healing for Dorcas together. They are the ones pleading with Peter to, quote, please come to us without delay, like the sisters of Lazarus. The community is moving beyond familial kinship into what makes us one as the body of Christ, the church, the koinonia, the shared common life. The people and the commu- the people shed communal tears. They recognized Dorcas as a disciple and they too practiced discipleship of compassion with one another. The community, those who meet in upper rooms together, the congregation bears resurrection hope. It is not just Dorcas who is raised from the dead. It is not just Peter with the power to pray, resuscitate, heal, raise to new life. It is the congregation that catches their breath, not just Tabitha, Dorcas, into new life. Like the community in Joppa, we need to continue to rise up in new ways of life serving one another and ever widening circles of becoming an inclusive community. This week, on May 4th, we celebrate the 66th anniversary since women received full clergy rights. What I mean by full clergy rights is that though women were ordained prior to 1956, they did not have full access like men to become district superintendents or elected as bishops. They did not have guaranteed appointments. So though they might have been ordained, it would take years not only for congregations to receive women to lead their congregations, but would take putting guaranteed appointments to enforce these inclusive and liberating ways of being disciples and loving communities together. And though the gates were opened in 1956, the road was made much narrower. As prior to women's full clergy rights, one did not need a graduate degree. A master's in divinity was not necessary. But as an MDiv became a requirement for full clergy rights, in a time when women were less represented, even in levels of receiving college degrees, the barrier created with new requirements made the journey more difficult than it had been for men prior. It would not be until 1980 that Marjorie Matthews would become the first elected woman bishop. Let me share some of the first and how long it took as a reflection of faithfulness and persistence of women, but more importantly, to call us in with the need of the love of being communal, relational, community, the body to raise these first representatives of other than male clergy persons. The first African-American woman bishop was Leon T. T. C. Kelly, elected in 1984. The first Latina bishop was Minerva Kakana, elected in 2004. Rosemary Wiener was the first woman bishop to be elected in the Central Conferences. She was elected bishop of the Germany Central Conference in 2005. 
Joaquina Felipe Nanala was the first woman bishop to be elected in Africa. She was elected bishop to the Mozambique Central Conference in 2008. I did not find Bishop Karen Oliveto li listed as our first lesbian bishop on the formal United Methodist Church listings, still on God's list of beloveds and one of my favorite bishops. And as far as I'm aware, there has not been an Asian American Pacific Islander woman bishop elected to date, and that speaks loudly more about our community of disciples than it does about the faithfulness of any individual AAI, AAPI clergywoman. I can speak from my own personal context as sexism in the Korean United Methodist Church and non-Korean United Methodist Church is very much active and alive. How many Korean clergywomen serve Korean United Methodist churches? Why do bishops not appoint clergywomen to Korean United Methodist churches? Why do Korean United Methodist Church reject Korean and or AAPI clergywomen? These are questions the community, the body of Christ, needs to respond to and not place the accountability on just our bishops or on individual women. These questions are also questions for larger, predominantly white congregations, as well as many AAPI persons serving in cross-cultural, cross-racial appointments like myself. The wall of photos of clergywomen who have served at Aldersgate United Methodist Church on the wall right outside of my church office is not that different from the wall of photos I grew up with in the Korean United Methodist Church. The only difference is that the wall of photos at the Korean United Methodist Church I grew up in was that there were no photos of any kinds of woman clergy, associate, or interim. Just the wall of men, even to this day, at the home church I grew up in and to which my father is still a member. Yes, the world will be different for my daughters than it was for my mom and or for myself, but the days are very long, and I pray that the years in God's eternal time will be shorter than we can imagine. May God call us to be like the community of Joppa, to intercede on behalf of one another, to be like Dorca, a compassionate disciple, and may we also be like Peter, who listens to God's calling and stays at Simon the Tanner's home. Let us be on the move with the movement of love. As I shared with a guest at yesterday's service for Polly, when it comes to being a loving and loving in community, the words we need to practice together is Vamanos. Vamanos. Let us go. Let us be on the way with one another. May it be so. Amen. Generous God, your gifts are countless. You lead us, guide us, and restore us when we need it most. May we recall this generosity now and remember the examples of Tabitha and others who share what they have and give those to those in need. We offer these gifts to you and pray that you will bless them for your work of ministry. Amen. Come, we that love the Lord, and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord, join in a song with sweet accord, and thus surround the throne, and thus surround the throne. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. To Zion, the beautiful city of God. 
Emmanuel's ground. 